Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, digital musical music interest session. Um, I'm Vic Cedar, I'll be the moderator, and we have Tom Dellinger and Bill Hyman. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn about what digital music is, how to get it, how to use it, and so forth. Um, each one of us will give a brief five or ten minute presentation, and then we'll open the floor to questions and see what interests you. Now, there should be some handouts in the back if you're just coming in. Make sure everybody gets one. And uh, without further ado, we'll let Bill Hyman start it off. Excuse my reach here. Just a quick comment first, and all of the, uh, both the moderator and those two of us who are participating on this. There is a rule at Call a Lab, correctly so, that there is no commercial promotion at any educational session. Having said that, for this session, is operating under some special rules for a very simple reason. The reason why the three panelists are here is because we are, in fact, larger and smaller commercial people. I say that with respect, okay, but you know, Tom and I are primarily in the music business, in this case digital. Uh, Vic is obviously involved in the whole digital side and also has his program for sale. This is done with the knowledge of the executive committee, and we are not here to promote Palomino Records at palominorecords.com, not here to promote Vic Cedar's website at cedernet, C-E-D-E-R dot N-E-T <laughs> dot com. Certainly not here from my mouth to promote either supremeaudio.com or dosado.com. That is not our purpose here. Having said that in a humorous fashion, each of those three websites has a ton of helpful information. Even forgetting the selling side of those websites, each of those websites really has a huge amount of uh, information, and each of us respectively, when it comes our turn, will talk about those things too, uh, because it is helpful to you. In fact, when we were teased before, oh, you gave this to me on paper, I think it was Keith said, you know, it should be in digital format. The fact is, it is in digital format, and you can certainly find it. Um, I would like to start, just a quick question, how many of you were here at last year's digital music session? Great. How many people are actively using MP3s, WAV files, digital formats of any kind? Great. Okay. Uh, I am going to start off with the basic introduction, the structures, the licensing issues, the uh, uh, recording media history, and then make some other general comments, and then we'll uh, move on down the line. Um, while I certainly don't want to read my presentation per se, I would like to sort of run down it uh, with you, quite frankly. Uh, as we look back on recorded uh, media, uh, I was teased that I forgot to put the Edison recording cylinder on here. Obviously, it came before the 78. But the fact is, you all know the history of the various kinds of, of uh, recording media that were there. I think the only one I actually left off that I could think of was the wire tape recorder, which was in the early 50s, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Uh, so I didn't have that one on there. But we're, in fact, living in definitely a digital age with varying formats. and. This whole industry, this whole technology is moving very, very rapidly, as those of you who are particularly involved in it know how fast it's changed. File sizes have dropped down with the uh, introduction of MP3s, and I'm sure there will be other technologies that come along. Uh, my little quip on the end there, you know, who knows what's coming in the future, digital chip implants. You may have your whole song library just on a little digital chip. They just slide under the skin in your wrist and, when, wrist, and when you get to your calling station, you just hold your wrist up to a scanner, it downloads your whole library, and it has all the accompaniment with the vocals and everything, background vocals in there that you have, of course, diligently prepared in advance. Who knows? And I don't think any of us up here are here to predict where this is going, but we are here to talk about the realities of where we are in the technology evolution and revolution uh, where we are right now. One of the revolutionary factors was the reduction in file size, and that is, in a simple term, and, and Vic will go into this in very technical terms, the MP3, it's a pretty effective way to move relatively large amounts of music in small space. In a simple term, a four-minute square dance record in general file sizes is about a 40 megabyte file if you look at it as a WAV file. But when you turn it into an MP3, depending on the exact length and density of the music and other factors, it turns into something between a 2.9 and a 3. 0.8 meg MP3 file, very a very hand manageable file. Whether you're doing it onto a mini disc, using it on your notebook or whatever, uh, there are certainly uh, some real advantages to that. Let me switch briefly. I'll leave the technical things uh, uh, to the others. Uh, let me switch briefly to the business side 
of digital music and talk a little bit about it. As you know, the recording industry has has been for a while and is continuing to be more in a business crisis. There's a price share coming in there where production costs, if you're using uh, you know, full professional musicians or even if you're doing it yourself, it's costing more and more money to generate this music and the cost of vinyl is going up. There is now definitely licensing uh, that has to be paid for the, the old days of, of uh, perhaps being a little bit more casual about that. They are in fact gone. Now you just can't get vinyl pressed without licenses. And that means that the producers are in a very stiff bind. And one of the neat things about the digital music revolution is that by using music in a digital form, you eliminate the lacquer master. That's the master from which the record is made coming off of the uh, original digital tape. You have the stampers, the steel stampers that are made. You don't have the shipping each way. You don't have the handling, the logging in, the uh, scanning, as in Tom's case. I know Tom uh, uses little uh, labels. Uh, the cardboard, the envelopes, shipping costs and everything else, all of those costs will really disappear and it'll come back down to genuine music production costs. And that makes it longer term a very attractive uh, medium. When you order a record online, you or order a song online, you'll be able to get, to get reasonably quick delivery of digital media that you save on your notebook, put onto a mini disc, CD, whatever medium you decide to go into. Uh, in our case, the, uh, the song package consists of a doc file, a Word, a Microsoft Word doc file with the cue sheet in there, any notes or anything else that's in there, copyright statements, of course, and then the A side and the B side, generally on a singing call, an instrumental side and a vocal side. In the case of a patter record, probably not with a doc file uh, to it unless there's specific notes, but certainly with the side A and side B. And those are delivered in our particular case. We have developed a whole new web application called filemagician.com, which you can visit the page on, but there's really nothing much there to see. If you'll flip to the second page, the inside of that first page, that is the way we're actually going to be delivering the music to you. It's on an email sent to you. It's the back of the first page where it looks like an email because that's exactly what it is. And I had Peggy send me a file. And it simply says that we, our company, has uh, asked File Magician to send that file to you. And you simply click on the download instructed, instructed line, and you will download that um, uh, file to your computer. The neat thing about this methodology is, unlike when you buy software online, when you're at the Microsoft website and you order it to buy, you have to download it right then normally. That's the normal procedure. It may not be a convenient time with this. You can actually do it any time. There are other delivery methods. They can be sent as attached emails, which we did for a while and became a little bit cumbersome because of file sizes. Uh, let's talk about mechanical licensing for the moment. I think I can say without having coordinated with Tom in advance, Tom and I are prob have together between the two of our companies have probably licensed more music in this industry than any than any other combination of one or two people there. We are we are the people who are doing most of the licensing, and both of us are extremely knowledgeable in the ins and the outs of it. It has become infinitely simpler since the discussion started three years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, it is now, in fact, relatively simple, but it still takes time. Every song sold on the Internet that is somebody else's writing, that does not mean an original song. If, you, if he or I or his son or whoever or one of our people have written the songs, that is then their license to grant. But if that song belongs to a publisher and a writer that must be licensed by the Harry Fox Agency, we have an Internet download licensing account, and we, in fact, have, I think, 138 songs fully licensed now. We probably have 60 others pending, and those are all obviously on our website when you click on MP3s. Uh, but the license has to be paid, and we are actually paying per click, which is really what has made this whole thing happen. Instead of prepaying $37.75 for 500 pieces of vinyl, which is what we have to do on records, we can pay per order. And because it's a per order cost rather than an upfront cost for 500, that makes it feasible. Until that rule change, there would have been no MP3s from Square Dance vendors on the web. Just, just could not take place. Uh, because of the costs involved in this and the digital format, uh, or excuse me, music has always been stealable. You could always, you know, make a copy by whatever medium it is and share your records with a friend and all that. And uh, it is, uh, frankly, even more easy, even easier now in the digital format, whether you're emailing a file or sending it on a mini disc or copying it on a, on a uh, regular computer disc. Uh, callers are at a crossroads, as I said last year. You have to really make a fundamental decision. You're either going to pay your fair share for the music, give the producers a revenue stream that enables them to continue to produce music, or 
you can steal the music and have no new music in the future. I know for a fact that a fair number of record producers are seriously considering ceasing producing music. I represent 61, I think it is, labels now, and I can tell you a lot of those producers are just at, the, at their wit's end. I had a discussion today with a guy who said, you know, I just can't make money on today's sales. Sales are obviously down somewhat, although not down as much as you would think, actually. And uh, so you're, you being we all are at a crossroads now whether or not we're going to stay honest, pay our fair share for the music, and so forth. Um, the example that I put on there, if, if you wonder what the impact of that is, let's say you call for your club, call the mainstream class for 30 weeks for your club, and the vice president records all of your sessions, and then the next year in the summer you're waiting for the contract to arrive, and the club vice president says, oh, no, Jack, we're going to play your tapes this year. There's no difference. It's, it's really the exact same issue. Um, I've already talked about the savings, so I won't really talk about that. On uh, caller equipment, upgrading and all that, should you, should you buy things now? As Tom and I both know, uh, very, very decent variable speed tape, uh, CD players are down to $159, $160, really quite reasonable. There are other larger component units. Uh, mini discs are well in the under $300 range now, some new models coming out that might, in fact, at the beginning of their life cycle, be at a slightly higher uh, price, and we will find out as soon as Sony decides what their U.S. pricing is going to be and when they're going to actually ship from Japan. Uh, there are options of mini disc, notebook, CDs, and I know Tom is going to uh, talk on the CDs a little bit more. Uh, that covers really the basics of of the, the highlights that I want to do, if you could just join me very briefly on the following, the second paper page and on uh, on my website, and I know Tom has things on his website, if you go right to our Square Dance page, there are about nine, page, nine pages on, on the page that you're looking at. It says the basics of MP3 format digital music. If you look to the left-hand column of that page, you'll see a whole MP3 column, also known as a table. And that table contains 12 or 13 links in there. They are all MP3 related, and I won't read them all to you, but they are the future of vinyl, saving, uh, saving and using MP3s, Cool Edit, all the other programs that are in there, which uh, are going to be talked about later, copying to CDs and so forth. And I just go through on those two, two or three pages, go through the very basics of the steps of how you can download MP3s, what you do when you get them, what you need to look at the previews. We have the real audio previews online. What you need to do that is step two. Uh, step three, saving and using it, mini disc, obviously, or a notebook computer. And then the various players that are on there. I do want to point out, uh, Vic has on his website all of the links to Winamp and, and uh, Music Match and Cool Edit and so forth, which we have also. Uh, we've also added another... Um, tempo, pitch, and speed control on there. It's called Pacemaker. It's in the middle of page three of five right there. And it's a really neat program. Uh, it's free, by the way. It's a free plug-in uh, that, where you can change the tempo or the pitch or both of them. And it's a very neat thing if you're going to be playing it on your uh, notebook computer. And then there are the music editing programs, which Vic is certainly going to go into. And that particular page ends with my, copy, my comments on illegal copying. I've already made those comments. Last comment I'd like to make in this part of the presentation is... Uh, the last two, two physical pages, actually four printed pages, are an article written by uh, Greg Anderson. Greg happens to be here in the front row at this session. He originally was going to be at another session. That's why I went ahead and printed it up. He had written this article uh, three-ish years ago, maybe four years ago, something like that, and he had sent it to me, and I asked him if he would update that to bring it up to where we are in MP3s now, and I did uh, uh, copy He sent it to me by email, and I added it on the Western Square Dance Western Square Dancing Dosado.com website. Uh, there's a link directly to it uh, with digital music as the header on there. But here's a copy of it. The address is at the bottom of the page. And once again, I won't go through all of the things, but Greg gives a very, very good rundown of the advantages and disadvantages of using mini discs. And if you haven't used them yet, this is a really great place to start. Uh, last comment is I do have not I don't want to distract you with it now while others are presenting, but I do have a notebook three ring binder that has all of the MP3 related pages, so you can reference them at some point later in the convention. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Bill. And uh, Tom, would you like to speak about the CDs? All right. Um, as Bill has said, technology is changing so fast, and, and computers are going to play a very, very important role. And a lot of folks 
say, well, I'm not ready for computers yet. What else is out there? Well, there's still lots of things to do. We uh, chose to do a survey about 90 days ago, and we sent out about 1,000 surveys to uh, customers and said, hey, what are you using today? Are you using records? Are you using MDs? Are you using CDs? Are you using MP3s? What do you think you're going to use in the future? Uh, how do you feel about paying more for records? Uh, and so on. Uh, got back about 500 responses, which was great. And I'm just going to give you a quick summary on the survey. And like all surveys, they can be skewed. So you have to read into it what you want to read into it. And we've got copies of them if you want to look at them during the convention. About 70% of the people that returned the survey are using records exclusively, which was a high number. I was, I was a little bit surprised, but exclusively using records. About 30% were using MDs and records. 55% uh, of those folks said, yeah, I'd buy a CD instead of a record if that's what's going to become available. And about 5% of them were using MP3s. Now, that number is low probably for the reason of exposure. Okay, Still new. Still new with all of us. Okay, And even a year ago, that number probably wouldn't uh, have been much smaller. It, it's... it's it's so much to absorb, but at least in, in Bill's case, in our case, we've put as much information on the website, and we're continuing to do it. Vic's got a lot on there, and you're going to have to just sit down and study and study and study and see what you want to do. We are basically in the business to offer you as many mediums as possible to make our activity successful, and that's what we have to keep in mind. Now, successful can be uh, kind of a big word. That means it's got to be successful for the producers. The retailers, the wholesalers, and you, the callers as customers. We've all got to be successful in this. So anyway, uh, the survey told me quite a bit. So having done the survey, got the results, I went back and wrote out an article. I said, okay, folks, here's what's out there Okay, in terms of CD players and, and built touched on a little bit, they've come way down in price, especially the variable speed. You know, for 160 bucks, you can buy a CD player plus or minus 16%. You can play your country western CDs in there. You can play customized CDs in there. You can do what you want to. You can plug it into the Hiltons. You don't have to buy any fancy equipment. You're done. If you're not interested in changing speeds very much, for $19.95, you can go to Walmart, Kmart, or whatever and buy a small Walkman, and that's a generic title, a little inexpensive recorder or a player, I'm sorry, and play the CDs. Very inexpensive to get into CDs if that's what you want to do or if you want to add those to your program. And a lot of the folks that, that sent back the survey said, well, I don't want to switch yet. I may not switch for a long time, but if the good music comes out and it's on CD and I can get it and use it inexpensively, I'll probably start using some of it. And that's fine. You know, I don't think any of us are going to try to push a medium down your throat and say it's this or nothing. Okay? And, and we got that back in the survey. We had a few calls. Well, by God, if, there, if I can't buy the record, I'll just quit. Well, that's your choice, okay? It may be just don't buy that record. You know, you still got thousands. Use the ones you have. There's nobody saying you have to buy that CD, that MP3, that audio file of some type. You know, if you don't want to go that route, don't go that route. I mean, we've been doing it 50-some years, you know, so continue to use them. Um, as far as recorders... Things are really getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And I shouldn't use that word, but some of them are cheap. I'll say inexpensive for the good models. You can now buy a burner for under $99 to put in your computer. You can convert your records onto CDs via the turntable or however way you want to play them directly into the computer. That's going to enter it as a WAV file. You can change that file. And Vic's probably going to hit that a whole, whole bunch. And do your own entire selection on CDs if that's what you want to do. Um, as far as the inexpensive players, you know, it's almost no cost to change over. Software, there's lots of it out there. A lot of free software that you can use once you've changed the medium from a record to some kind of digital source. And I'll leave it at digital source. You pick the medium you want. There's just so many programs that you can use. Some advantages of CDs uh, versus a few of the other things. You have a hard copy. You can always go back to it. Um, you can have the uh, Q sheet or cheat sheet, whatever you want to call it, directly burnt on the CD. We've uh, got the software put together so that uh, this, the uh, the Q sheet comes up on the first track, the instrumental comes up on the second track, or vocal on the third track, however way you want it done. It can be customized, and you put it in your computer, bring it up, print it right off, you've got your sheet. 
you can click it, uh, back over to your, your audio player of your choice and play the CD. Um, obviously, the expense is less for the producers. If they can go in and make music and don't have to worry about the lacquers, the pressing plates, the labels, everything else is involved in trying to get that vinyl to you. Obviously, it's a lot less cost. Somewhere down that road, that's going to get passed on. The one advantage of uh, CDs is you're uh, going to be able to pr uh, purchase multiple tracks of songs on that CD. We've got the program set up uh, so that you can call in and say, I'd like to have this record, this record, this record, this record, and this record. If we have the contracts with the producers, we're going to be able to burn all those songs on the CD and send them to you, one CD. If you want it in a different key, we're able to run it through the computer and change the key and give it to you that way. We have producers on board already that are going to produce CDs that have an instrumental track in three different keys. It's going to have a track with harmony. It's going to have a track without harmony. It's going to have a track with vocal backups. You have your choices. okay? And most of this is going to be at the same price of records because it doesn't cost the producer that much to go in and make those changes while he's there. And he doesn't have to make a plate or a master for each one of them. So you're going to get a variety. You're now going to have that song in the keys that you want it in. We're going to be able to have the masters on file so that we can burn it the way you want it. There's a lot of records that are out of print today. The very good records that the masters are gone. We're going to be able to, or the plates. We're going to go be, uh, be able to go back and restore those from either the original tapes that they have or even in some cases take a record, run it through the computer, run it through the... Uh, the hiss detectors and all the software that's available today to take out all the pops and everything, take out that true sound of vinyl, and give it back to you in somewhat of a digital sound. We're going to be able to do that with those songs and bring those back into the, the activity for us. Um, one of the other advantages of CDs is we're hoping that we can go back to the dancers and say, we would like you to buy into our program. We would like you to help support the square dance, round dance, music. We're going to be able to give it to you on a CD, play it in your stereo, play it at parties, play it in your car. You know, it's almost impossible to rent a car today without a CD player in it. We're going to be able to give them something they can use. So we're hoping to get back into that part of it. One of the other nice features about CDs, and I know Vic's going to talk about this, is if you buy the CD and you are into the computer situation, you put it in there, you have the ability to change it the way you want to. You change the key. You, you've got that WAV file. You manip no, manipulate it the way you want it. You're going to be able to do that. Disadvantages, you might have to buy some more equipment. Maybe. Depends on how fancy and sophisticated you want to get. You know, if you're happy with speed of 45, buy a simple player. The uh, One of the disadvantages is that you're still going to have to buy it through the mail. Yeah, you might have to wait a day or two for it, but you'll be able to get 10 to 15 songs on one disc instead of paying $3.95 or $4 postage, you pay $1.21. So you got some you got some things to weigh out. One of the other neat features about CDs is it's comparable to all of the, mu the standard music in today. Uh, pop music, country western, all of that's available in CD. Now square dance music can be right along with those. You know, you can, you can have all the CDs there, all the different types of music, and play them in the same format. Having said that, I'm, not, I'm done. Thank you, Tom. Do, do, do. Boy. All right. Okay, so... Um, from my perspective, I'm not a producer like you know these two are, but I'm basically a caller, and I've been using MP3s pretty much much exclusively for calling for more than over over a year now. Um, I've been using a computer to play MP3 files at the dance, and right now my computer has almost 1,200 uh, MP3s on it, and it's very nice to have that because you can they're all all in one place. I don't have to carry, you know, handfuls of records. I can immediately find what I want because it's all in like a database format. It's in a list. I can sort. I can have it display all my patter records, all my exciting singers, whatever. Just I can just sort out whatever I want and choose the records I want. Um, so I'm going to start off here by kind of explaining what 
give you a little background of what MP3 and digital music is. Um, normal music is like a bunch of wave waveforms and sound. And uh, what we do for digital music is it's just kind of like taking a film of something, where a film like takes little tiny time slots of of shots of the music. So in a typical film, there might be 60 or 30 frames per second that they've taken a little shot of a picture, a, a slice in time. This kind of the same thing with digital music, except the time frames are like really small. So there's like, I think it's like 44,000 uh, slices per second that it takes these, these shots to get the digital music. Okay, so that's like a normal wave or CD file, CD or wave files basically these mini tiny slots of uh, digital music and they've taken the wave and they've gen and they've got the amplitude and the frequency and they've got that stored in a digital format. Well, what MP3 is, is it takes that and it collapses it by about a factor of 10 to make it a lot smaller, which is one reason why MP3 is so popular. It's very small, it's easy, it's much quicker to download than the original CD track. Um, and the way they do that is it's kind of a sneaky way of doing it. It's called, it's a lossy compression, which means when they compress it, they actually lose some of the resolution or the data or the fidelity in there. But they do it in a way that is imperceptible to the human ear. So if you have like two sounds that are very close to each other in time, and one of them is like very loud and one's very soft, they can drop the soft one and you wouldn't notice it because they're like right next to each other and you wouldn't notice it. Or maybe there's two sounds that are almost identical in pitch, and they're right next to each other, they can drop one of them or merge the two into one single sound. And by doing that, they make the file a lot smaller. So they compress it that way, and then they compress it by doing a standard like zip kind of compression on the file, and they get it real small. Um, and a, a one, one side effect to doing that is if you go and download an MP3, or you've got an MP3 on your computer, and you want to do something to it, like change the tempo, change the pitch, uh, whatever. What you have to do to edit it is uh, you would go into an editor, uh, a, uh, a WAV file editor, and it would convert the file back into a WAV file. You could make your changes, because it's just a regular file, and then compact it back up. And by doing that, you've actually, con you've actually done the... Uh, uh, the zipping it up twice, which means you've made like a copy of a copy. And each time you do that, you're going to lose some fidelity, which is one reason why it would be a good idea to have like the original uh, like wave file on the disk, because that would be a better one to work at, work with. Um, and basically, when you've got the wave file or the MP3 on the computer, it's just another file. It's just like a Word document or whatever. There's plenty of editors out there to change things. If you don't like the middle track, of you know the middle break in a singing call, get rid of it. Put put the opener in there again, or put the closer, or or you can edit it and take pieces of it and mix and match. And there's plenty of stuff to do. Um, so what I do when I call is I have a laptop computer. I have a, a Hilton or a, an amplifier. So I don't need the turntable portion. I just hook it up and I've got my uh, laptop up here. And I might play something for you later. Show you how it all works. Um, the laptop has like lots of storage space, so you can put, you know, thousands of records on there. Um, I can fit about 600 Square Dance MP3 files in uh, one gigabyte of storage, or on a CD-ROM, a CD-ROM disk, I can fit about 380 MP3 files. Whereas typically, uh, on a normal CD-ROM, there's like enough min enough uh, for 74 minutes of songs, which is about 30, 33 uh, songs that you can fit on that. Another thing you'll need if you want to play from the computer is a player, and there's lots of them out there. A lot of this software is out there for free on the internet or for a very minimal cost. You can download players such as Winamp, which is one of the more popular ones. There's also Microsoft Media Player, uh, Real Player, and, and there's several listed in uh, Bill's uh, paper there. And what I've done with all my records is I've, I've put them on my turntable and recorded them into the computer. And you do that by running a program which they call a ripper, which like basically does a recording. And the, the most popular one out there is Cool Edit, and it allows you to, to uh, record. 
And then you've got your WAV file, and you can edit it, save it, break it up, whatever, and put it out to disk. And uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, we'd like to open up the floor to questions. And we'll have a microphone here. I'd like, hello. I'd like you to state your name and, and your question so everyone can hear. Greg Anderson, Colorado. When, if someone dis makes a decision to convert to the use of MP3s and, and wants to download some of the software to use, is the documentation that comes with the, the software sufficient for people who are a little bit hesitant, especially the older we get, the more hesitant we are perhaps to, to take on new technologies, or do you find a stray teenager somewhere to sit down with you and explain it? <laughs> um, well, in general, it's very easy to download files. Um, these guys are certainly, it's in their best interest to make it as easy as possible for you to do this. Um, basically, once you've got your player on the computer, it associates the MP3 extension or whatever kind of file you have extension for this. You just double-click on it, and it just brings up the player, and it can start playing. And the player looks like a, a regular, in general, a regular kind of CD player. It's got pause, start, you know, rewind, all that stuff. So it looks pretty much like a, a regular physical player. If I can just add on to that, not being self-promoting, but my website has, for example, for instructions for cool edit, has one, two, three, four. It has a four-page article just on cool edit. And as I like to, uh, when I send out audio equipment uh, to the fitness industry in this case, and I have instructions, my instructions always start with those very famous high-tech words: "Unpack the merchandise." No, it's, there, there are no. If you, if you look at this page, I think you will agree with me. This, this assumes that you know absolutely nothing about it. And I also have to tell you, this you might recall, of those of you who were here last year, I bragged to you about having a music webmaster that I had hired as a part-timer, and uh, he was 16 years old. I no longer have a 16-year-old music webmaster uh, to write these pages. I had a now 17-year-old music webmaster write them, and he actually wrote, with a couple of rare exceptions that I wrote, he actually wrote all of the technical pages here, and I think you would agree with me, number one, from a verbal skills point of view, the kid's particularly talented, but he wrote it in a way that really anybody, it tells you details, and we give a graphic picture of exactly what you're going to see on the screen. We make no assumptions. We have that for Cool Edit, Gold Wave, uh, Music Match, right on the page. Uh, I just recently bought a uh, CD burner, and it's got some programs in it, and I, for the first time, recorded some music from my turntable into the computer, and it either couldn't find or, or it doesn't have, it seems like, a level control that I can put an optimum level into the computer. I get one song louder than the other. Uh, is this a, a shortcoming of the particular program that I have, or just did, did I just not find a gain control in my computer? I'm, I'm sure Vic's worked with these as well as, as I have. It, it's in there. You, you probably just missed it. But um, virtually all of the burners that, that I've uh, purchased and have recommended to people have software, and, and at least every one of them I have seen does have a record level control. Uh, it's, it's similar to some of the um, tape recorders that we've used over the years. You can pick a manual control or you can pick an audiomatic level control, and it will do it for you. But it's, it's probably just an oversight, but they are there. Uh, and I say every burner, the, the one disadvantage is every burner has its own software, okay? But in the same respect, fortunately, in computer programming for commercial products, and I call that a commercial product, not a consumer product, almost everything is menu-driven. So it's, it's usually got a help column that you can go right to, key in one word, and take you right to the trouble spot. So really what you need to do is just go into the help column, click on it, go down to record level or record, and there's probably five or six things right in there that you're going to find the one you're looking for. I'd like to add something to that. Um, I use Cool Edit to do my recording, and I don't know what you have, but you probably have something. Music Match Jukebox. Um, in Cool Edit, you would go up to... After you've recorded in the music and you've got it in the WAV format, 
on Cool Edit, you'd go up to the menu and you'd select Effects, and then you'd go to Volume Normalization. So I would search for the word normalization, which basically increases your the wave amplitudes to a, 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 as, loud, as loud as they can kind of like get in the file. So look for the word normalization. Uh, how many MP3 uh, listening options do you have on your website? Like I've looked at it in the past and there didn't seem to be a whole lot of selections. Have you expanded that to include a lot more records? Well, either one of uh, Bill, I, I guess I was looking at Supreme Audio when I was looking. A week after last year's convention, when the discussion first took place, I had 11 MP3s available that were licensed. That crept up to about 20. I now have, I believe the number is 138. And if you look in the left-hand column of the web page that you have there, you'll see in the directions, it tells you quite clearly where to go. There are two pages that you want to look at in particular. One is... MP3 downloads, that has all 130 plus of those on that page. There's another page listed towards the bottom of that left-hand column on the links that you have on the web page, obviously, that says previews. Previews has over 300 songs that are real audio samples, and you can listen to all of those. If they are MP3s, MP3 only, or 45s, they are so indicated after each and every title. I have all of those pages printed out here. It's about 24 pages that are printed out on that on that particular listing and there's one other comment I wanted to make I wanted to read to you a quick we are dealing with two types of audio to ask your real audio question we are dealing with two types of audio formats real audio player enables you to listen to the streaming audio previews on this page they are not mp3s they're only for listening on the web MP3 format files are the actual files you will purchase. You will need an MP3 player already discussed extensively here uh, uh, to use these files. Download details below. They're on all of our pages, obviously. Does that answer your question? And I think Ben had a... Hi, Vic. Uh, to address the person who had the question about the levels, also beyond the software, if you're working from a Windows platform, they also have software built into the normal Windows programming that addresses both volumes, gains, and everything else. Typically on the right-hand side lower corner, there is an icon of a speaker. If you click on it, it can bring up all the information you need for both input and output from your computer. Um, that's called the Windows Mixer, and you should set all those to max when you're doing this. Not always. Well, gets a big surprise. The other real quick thing about the, the audio files, and, and Bill talked about it, be careful when you start asking about audio files because he made a good point. There are real audio files in MP3, so you have to decide which ones you're looking for. And, and I'm sure in Bill's case and my case, we are trying to maximize the quality of the music at the same time minimize the size of the file. So when we talk in terms of real audio files, they are much smaller than the MP3 files, but they're typically used for the samples to listen to, okay, only. Yeah, but the downloads are going to be MP3s, 100%. Mary Castleberry, Joplin, Missouri. I just have a question for Tom, maybe for Bill. You talked about in the future possibly having CDs with selectable tracks. Are you going to do that with mini discs at all for us who have invested in mini discs? Right now, we have no plans to do it in mini disc. Uh, we have not discussed that with the producers. We've got about uh, 40 some labels that are, uh, that are buying into the CD process. We've not talked about the MDs at all. And primarily because we want to make a CD master to some degree for, for copulations. And in, in mini disc, Everybody uses mini disc a little differently. Some of them want them at. Uh, there's actually different speeds now that you can play the uh, the mini disc at and record them at. And so if we start making those, then we're going to have to deal in the different speeds. Some folks want them recorded different uh, levels. They want stereo. They want everything in mono, what have you. So uh, at this point, no. Keith Ackerson, Arkansas. If we hear a song that we want. Can we contact you to see if you can get it, even though it's not a square dance song? Uh, the answer is actually, a simple answer is no, 
because for me to sell you the first copy of that song, I have to license 500 of them. Let's assume I could work it out with the producer. Now, there are some record labels, and I know Tom has done this, where you can go to the writer and the publisher and work out a private deal and maybe even get it for free, as I'm sure has been done. But the general rule of thumb is, no, we can't do that. I think I had that discussion with Mary at some point, either on the phone or last. I don't remember when it was. Didn't we talk? Or somebody asked me about, you know, if I said... I. Somebody in here last year said, I'd like to give you six titles. Could you put them all on a mini disc? The answer is, I could, but the cost would be too high. Because let's say if it's six vinyl tunes that we have right now, to give you a different medium, I must have a different license. Or said differently, if I've, if I've got tune A licensed to 500 copies and have only made 300 of them, you would think I have 200 free left. That's true as long as they're vinyl. They do not cover CD. They do not cover mini disc. You need every medium has its own uh, mechanical license requirement. On those physical mediums, the non, the physical medium, CD, mini disc, and so forth, and vinyl, you need a license with a minimum of 500. And on the digital download side, due to the new rulings and legal situations that have evolved, we can sell that per click. So said differently, we can sell you those six tunes at X dollars per tune, and then you can load them onto your mini disc and program them any way you want and create your own library. As I know, Greg Anderson, has, has, he's created his mini discs over the years. He has his various library criteria that he's done. Keith Ferguson, Saratoga, California. Uh, actually, two questions with the, the main one. Uh, related to using a notebook computer, uh, to play back at the dance, do you find any reliability problems? I know at home when I play any kind of music file on my home uh, uh, computer, which is not a notebook, but uh, every now and then the computer, I guess, decides to do something else for a fraction of a second, and it kind of skips and goes on, and if you're at a dance, that wouldn't be very good. Uh, have you had any problems with that? Do you have any solutions to that? The, uh, the second question I'll go ahead and ask is just, is there any kind of update on the licensing or legality of us taking our vinyl, f if we own the record ourselves and just putting it onto a mini disc and using that at a dance, uh, is there any kind of update on that? Okay, well, we'll do the, the second question first. Uh, once, you've all, once you have a copy of the record that you've bought or whatever, you can put it on whatever medium you want. It's your copy. You, you're legally making backups. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's the way it is. Right. Yeah, you can do harmony, speed changes, whatever, to that music. Um, as for the notebook reliability issue, um, we all know that Windows is the most <coughs> reliable <laughs> <laughs> operating system around. Um, no, in, seriously, uh, I haven't had much problem. Um, I do know, I mean, I've written a computer program that uh, takes uh, will take two different... Uh, uh, players and control them, and it controls the Microsoft Media Player and the Winamp Player. Now, the Mac Microsoft Media Player, when I play back and do like looping, I've got automatic looping set up. Um, there is occasionally a, a little burp in there when it's doing that. However, the Winamp Player, when I do that, it seems to have an internal buffer that keeps like you know maybe four or five seconds worth of music in there. So when you actually do the reset, it's like really smooth. Um, so you don't really notice it with that. I can give you, I'll be more than happy to give you a demo on how that works if you'd like. The, quest no. the question is, you don't take a separate notebook to the dances? No, I don't. Um, in, in, when I first started out doing this, you know, like a year and a half ago, I would take a pile of records with me, and I had my regular old Hilton 75A, and everything would be fine, and, you know, occasionally I'd use a record, but, and, you know, occasionally the thing crashes, but it's, it's not, <laughs> I, it, it, I mean, it occasionally happens. I mean, it's, it's fairly new technology doing this. Um, in general, it's very, it's very good and reliable, though. Alice Wall from Carson, Iowa. I had that same problem with skipping and stuttering on my uh, Centralium, the Cool Edit. If you find that it, it sort of drags through a note and then it plays it quick and then you wind up with two notes where one note should have been, and it's, it, but it 
keeps dragging through, that's a memory problem, and, and I'll talk to you about it separate if you'd like, if that's what the problem is. Because I tried Microsoft, they didn't help. I tried Centralium, they didn't know. And then I talked to Patricia, and she sort of knew. But And then I did it myself, and I fixed it. So if you have a problem, I can tell you what to do there. My question is, is there any way to quickly find the frequency that the vocal is on so that you can delete it or diminish it? In other words, can I take Alabama off of the Alabama CD? You mean the words, or? There are pieces of equipment that will eliminate a high percentage. I have not seen or talked to anyone, even in the studios, that can take it all out. There are some very fancy karaoke equipment that will allow you to separate about 80%. What happens in the recording industry today is they put the vocal in the middle. Well, you're not going to get it all out. Yeah, got them ready. Okay. However, if they, if, they, if they move it to the left or the right or even split it, you have a chance. But the industry knows, so they put it right down the middle. Okay, my question, I'm Lynn Webster from the Twin Cities. I got a Macintosh computer, and most of what you're talking about sounds like it's for, like, IBMs or Windows. What would be best for a Macintosh? Um, there are plenty of players out there for the Macintosh. There's versions of many of these. My website has links to most of the Macintosh players. Simple as that. John Marshall, Virginia. Uh, just to make sure I understand, backing up a bit, if uh, we take records that we own um, and we play it on a turntable, record it to a hard drive uh, to make a disc or actually keep it in the hard drive uh, on a laptop, for example, that we're going to use, when we're recording it in that fashion, is it in fact at that point a WAV file? You then do with it what you will and then at some, in some form or fashion compress it at that point to make it an, an MP3 file? Yes, there's, there's, two, there's two steps going on here. The first step is when you read in or, or input the uh, sound into your computer, it's stored as a WAV file. That's the, the native format for sound in the computer. Okay. Then when you actually save the file, you save it as an MP3 file. Okay. And then when you're actually playing back the MP3 file, it's going through the decompression stage uh, real time to get to get your music back. One thing you want to be careful of when you do that is if you make changes to that uh, and you do the save as or whatever, saves or whatever, make sure you, when you're all done, get rid of the extra ones because, man, you're filling that computer up in a hurry. You know, you're talking about 40 meg every time you hit that thing. So be careful about making eight versions and leaving them out there unless you've got some pretty good sized hard drives, which is today's market's not that expensive, but do keep in mind each time you save one of those, uh, and it's good to save two or three of them. Don't, don't get yourself caught short that you fixed it, moved it to MP3, and then, oops, wasn't quite what I wanted, because you don't want to reverse that one. You really don't, and, and I know he'll talk about it. I'm sure he's done some of those where he thought he was finished, and he made it to MP3, and then he wasn't really happy, and he don't want to go back the other way. What I end up doing on all this is I actually save the WAV file, and then I make a CD with 30 WAV files or so, and then back, back save that. So that, then I just have the MP3s on, remaining on the hard disk. Uh, I want to clarify something that uh, I think I understand, but I'm not sure. Tom, you had talked about uh, the possibility of putting out uh, different tracks, like a track with music only, one with harmony, one with this, one with... You're not talking about all in the same musical selection, like a multi-track recording, are you? You're talking about different... Uh, Selection number one has harmony. Selection number two doesn't have harmony. That's sort of the different recordings on the 
That's correct. I'm talking about different tracks. Well, we can do it two different ways. One of the things that we're that we're caught up in in this session is we don't have time to demo everything. And and, and Bill, I know, has got some stuff that he'd be glad to show you back in the booth. And so do we. We've got the CDs with the data on the CD. We can show it to you. We can show it to you the CDs with split tracks, left and right, it's voice on one, music on the other. You can actually have and be calling harmony with Gary Shoemate tonight if you want to. Uh, or Ken Bauer or whoever because he's over there on the other channel. We also, the, the producers have the, are working on the CDs and I, for example, I talked to Jack Berg last week. He has a copy of Celebration. When they did it in the studio, when they first made the, the, the music, they had the vocal harmony all the way through the track. Before they made the vinyl, they chose that wasn't the route they wanted to put the vinyl out in because they were, a lot of folks didn't want that much. So they took and only put the harmony on the taglines. So he has that cut. He also has another cut in a different key. He also even has a short version. I'm not sure why he shortened the Square Dance record, but he did. So now we have four different versions. Well, we're going to be able to put all four versions of that on a CD and sell it to you for the price of one record. And you get to choose which tracks you want to use. Shane Graham from Belleville, Illinois. Uh, in speaking about all of this, what is the minimum requirements for a computer? And minimum requirements obviously isn't what you actually need, so what would you recommend? Um, I basically have been telling people that practically any notebook, laptop, computer you buy today should do just fine. Um, if you uh, personally, I would look for something that has a uh, large amount of disk space because these things, even though they are, you know, compressed from 40 megabytes down to, you know, two or three megabytes, after you start getting up plenty of them, they start eating up space. So, um, for example, I my old laptop was a 4.7 gig uh, hard drive on it, and after I got about 900 MP3s loaded on there, that was about enough <laughs> to make things start slowing down and you know not having enough extra disk space so I would look for um, lots of hard disk space 10 20 megabyte uh, gigabytes should be fine and since you're going to be using this for audio I would also look you know if they if they say it's a multimedia computer or they talk about having a good sound card something like that I'd look into that too but any other than that practically any laptop should suffice Okay, even with uh, the laptop and the, the smallest uh, amplifier and all that kind of stuff, you still use, what, your usual Yak Stack speakers, or do you adapt something different for the oh, yeah. sound? The, or? the speakers are the normal Yak Stacks or Hilton horns or whatever you got. You're, you're, just, you're just going in through one of the, uh, the music in uh, line up here just like you would with a CD or a MD or whatever. I'm not trying to read your mind, but I'm, I'm wondering if you're saying, are we going to stereo? You know, because we're in mono, folks. You know, once when it comes out the Hilton, it's mono. We're not changing any of that. We could, and you can, you know, but if you're taking the laptop and feeding it back through the Hilton or the, the amps that we use today, we haven't changed anything as far as the output, what you're going to plug that into at all. Uh, Terry Lewis from Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, you were talking about the Q sheet and the MP3, uh, I believe, as being two separate items. Is there any way of to, can they piggyback each other and go on the laptop and, and come on the screen? Maybe if you're teaching or something that you're workshopping. Or well, uh, <laughs> well, this is right up my line, I guess. Um, uh, try not to do all the self-promotion, but um, yes, you can you can do that sort of stuff. Uh, you can certainly have the player going simultaneously while your cue sheet is up there. Uh, the program that I've written actually, when you actually select the music to play, it automatically brings up the cue sheet, and it, it brings up you know choreography sequences, t uh, a tip timer, a break timer, all sorts of stuff like that. Well, the question is, does it automatically scroll? For automatically scrolling, you, well, you just hit the page up or cursor up, cursor down. 
in, in the same respect with the CDs that have the uh, the data cue sheet or whatever in the music, it you know the Windows is great for that because you minimize one, bring up the player, start it, bring back up the other screen, and, and you got the cue sheet right there on the screen, so you can go either way. Dean Fischel from Minnesota. Uh, this question is a little off the computer, but it made me think of the miniaturization. Does any has anyone tried those little Bose speakers for any kind of public use? Um, I I personally actually with me right now. I have a little tiny. It's a Radio Shack eighty nine dollar speaker that claims it has a wide angle and all this stuff. And I'll, I'll actually put it up here afterwards if you want to listen to it. Um, I found it's good for at least four squares. I'm a franchise Bose dealer, okay? And I know Bose. And in all honesty, they're wonderful speakers. And I sell them to dance studios and fitness facilities uh, for the smaller facilities. I honestly would not even personally use that for a square dance. In a smaller workshop environment, fine. But the beauty of the other speed, the regular square dance speakers, the axe stacks that, that uh, we use uh, mostly, or direct or any of the Hilton speakers, is that they're very focused. The, the key to them is they have a focused sound, and they can really throw sound to the back of the hall. And that's really the primary difference. It's not always a question of what's the nicest or prettiest sounding sound, but rather what's going to project the vocal commands and at least the basic feeling of the music, not in studio quality uh, high, highest fidelity performance, but rather what will get the music message out and with intelligibility as to the vocal side. Just a quick, uh, coming back to the Mac question that was asked before, right on the handout that I gave to you on the page that has page four or five on the top are all of the uh, uh, PC, uh, Mac players on there also. Any program that is PC, Mac, or Unix, I've indicated that on all of them. And then there are a couple of other page references at mp3.com, uh, Mac Amp, and Harmony Central, and so forth. There are a whole bunch of other uh, Mac sources. It's right on your handout. The other thing about sound, and I know Vic's probably played with this a little bit, a lot of the software, if you want a different sound for listening purposes, not necessarily for teaching or for dancing, you can go in there and with a click of a button and you can make that song sound like it's playing in Carnegie Hall. Okay? Uh, with the speakers we're using today. There is, you can make it sound like big band. You can make it, it, there's hundreds of different ways you can make that sound come out. Okay? Without having to change the speakers even. But keep in mind, it's not for dancing purposes, but if you're just wanting to listen to that music in a different atmosphere. Yeah, those, those kinds of programs are usually under the, the term digital signal processors, and they take the, the input and they, and they tweak it a little bit to make it sound like something. They even have a vinyl sound, so you can make normal CDs sound like a vinyl record. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> question, question regarding downloading of MP3 files. If the desire is then to take the MP3 file from your computer and record it to a mini disk, I, if I remember correctly, my computer has a earphone plug jack. Can I then come out of the earphone jack into the mini disk, or is that going to be an imp improper signal to accomplish recording from the computer to the mini disk? Um, I believe that should be fine. You might have to go to the, the Windows mixer and, and tweak the uh, volume levels to make sure that they're high enough. If they're too low, you're going to get a bunch of background noise or you know buzzing and stuff. Uh, Ralph Collip, you see New Hampshire. I've done that f four or five different ways, and I find coming out of the earphone jack is not a good quality sound, if you get any sound at all. Okay, you're so better you're off coming speaker? out of... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, recording to a mini disc, I'm talking about. Coming from a desktop into a mini disc, um, you've got to come out the back of the machine. There's, there's a couple of output uh, jacks in the back of the machine you can plug into. Yeah, into the, right into your soundboard. It, right yeah. into your soundboard. In general, you have to play around a bit, bit with it to get to just try the different input and output jacks. But I mean, but you have to be careful that you don't actually overload your sound card. I know one person who actually plugged in the high uh, output from something into his, his uh, microphone input in the sound card and uh, fizzed it out. <laughs> okay, I um, 
recently got a Sony. They had an offer for a USB port input device that we could I could get for free. You can get it. Uh, it's on the internet. I think I sent Bill a, an email regarding that, and uh, I can get that information for you. I don't have it right now, but it's supposed to give you a good sound. I haven't been able to compare it because I haven't done that much, but it's supposed to give a better sound than the sound output from your sound card. Any other questions for the panelists? No more questions? We're almost or about 4.30, so. Just one quick comment on the music, two comments on the music production side. Uh, the late Johnny Wyckoff uh, had sent us a fair number of digital songs on the Blue Star labels, which we were putting on, putting on the Internet. And uh, one of them, just due to an inadvertence when he created the mini disc, had cut off the front end of the song to maybe three notes. They were simply missing. And um, my music webmaster, we, sh we, we share a room. He's got the big workstation with the big computer, and I'm over there in the corner with the old one now. And uh, he uh, said, ah, I got a problem with this. And he told me what happened. He said, let me play with it. And he cut the two notes out of the middle break, pasted them back on the front end. And, I, and I'll bet you are both of our fortunes, you can't find which song it was. I mean, you just cannot tell. It really is incredible what you can do with the digital technology. On a couple of other songs from one of the producers, the masters were simply destroyed. He didn't have them. He wanted to put them out as MP3s, and we will be clear they're not up yet, but we will be clearly marking those as remastered. He took clean vinyl, or what we call virgin vinyl, vinyl that hadn't been played. We recorded it from the vinyl and did what he calls his default devinyling uh, filter, okay, which is, you know, hisses, clicks, or anything like that. And he's got a pretty standard setting now that on those that we've experimented on, I would suggest to you that the MP3 on those will actually be better than the vinyl that, we, that we've delivered. On another one, um, I found a new baby on Blue Star. Our MP3 version is actually better than the vinyl was really from the very beginning. If you have that record, you know for the past 20 years or whatever it was now, that, has been, that was overloaded on day one. I don't know how it happened or why it happened, but it was always a very overloaded song, and we've taken a lot of that off. It's not perfect, but it's actually an improved version. So with these editing programs, in this case, he uses cool, mostly cool edit. Uh, you can really do some marvelous things. Uh, he also uses Gold Wave, by the way, which is another great program. One more question? Uh, yeah, it's not so much a, yeah, I say it's a question. I, I know that both Tom and Bill have some things in the booth that we can go and look at. You had indicated that. Uh, that I'd also like to have a chance to, to see the program you were talking about for managing uh, the music. If you, if, could you stay a minute to, to Yeah, I'll that? stay and show that to God, whoever wants to see it. One of the underlining things that we really want to get across today, and, and Bill said it, and Vicki, and, and I want to emphasize is this is a changing world. The digital stuff is changing daily. Don't be afraid of it. Please, please, please ask the questions. Visit the websites. Pick up the phone. Call us. We want you to be able to use as much of the music that's out there in the way that you want to use it. We want you to be able to change it to suit your needs. Today we have more technology than we know what to do with. The Cool Edit, you can have 54 tracks of recording if you want to. It's endless. If you've got that favorite song of yours and you've got to have a cowbell at the end of it, you can put a cowbell at the end of it. Okay? So, you know, it, it's just, don't be afraid to play around with some of that stuff. Make it so that it's fun, make it entertaining, make it your show. You have those tools today. If you would like a sample MP3 file to play with, I will happily send you one. Just send me an email and say, Bill, please send me a sample MP3 file. I have about eight or ten of them. I think I have one from most of the producers prepared. And I will send you a short one. It's really the opener and the first four or five notes going into the first figure. It's really just a sample. It's intended not as free music, but really as a vehicle, a medium, a test, so that you can practice downloading it. You can drop it into the editing programs, play with it, distort it, twist it, tweak it, filter it, and just make sure you keep the original file 
off to the side. Make, make, so I want to send it to you once. Okay. Make, make a copy of that, you know, sample one, sample two, sample three, and make notes as to what you've done to it and go through the experimentation process. It actually is a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. Okay. Well, thank you for attending the session and thank Tom and Bill. Um, yeah, I can do that. is uh, coming out. I probably should turn this around so you see what it looks like. But. Yeah, I'm coming out of the, uh, probably the line out. Right? Yeah. Um, and this is actually my program running. And this is a music player and it's running the Winamp player, which is down here. It's going to be hard doing it backwards here. That's, that's one of the free players from the, on the internet. And I can take this, and there's a, they've got lots of, uh, they have things called plugins, which allow you to do things. This here's a Chronotron plugin, which allows you to, uh, this is shift, this is, oh. So this increases or decreases the tempo, but keeps the pitch the same. So you'll notice it's exactly the same. And notice it like does it without any jumping. Right. Yeah, well this this one will do that without doing it. And it does it while you're playing it. And it's pretty smooth. Um, this is Winamp with the Chronotron plugin. Then they have another plugin that will uh, change the pitch and not the speed. And then the one that had, Bill actually had on his paper over there, um, let's get this, turn this off, I guess. The one that Bill had on his paper was one of the ones I tried, which actually didn't work on my machine, so. <laughs> Any? Yes, I do. Um, Okay, so, so this is a, a shot of uh, my program. So it's got this 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 song up here, and uh, it's got the key sheet, and you can go and scroll down. As you get, oh, sorry, it's got the whole thing on there. Um, and then I've also got lists over here of uh, like singing calls sequences and things that I can go through and. This this here is the program that I sell. So yeah, I so, I oh, you do. That's what I'm trying to figure out how you do something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Patricia has the same question. <laughs> I can that, but I can't <laughs> um, I can show you how to set up the dance if you want. Um, and there's also a timer here that will time your tips as you go. You, here's the a database of like patter songs. Right now, there's it's got 11, 1130 songs in here. And uh, let me make the font a little bit larger so you can see. There. So I can sort by title, label. They're all in here. Just double click on one, bring it up. I don't know what that one was. I just double clicked on. Oops. No. Oh. This one doesn't have a loop set.
Same way with the data file. It's already on the, it'll be right there on the disk. Right there, yeah. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's what one of the things Vic hit on is if he's going to get that file, he would prefer it be in that format. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I prefer it in a way. Yeah. If you want to edit it or shorten it or do whatever you want, you need the WAV file. If you did it with the MP3, when you recompress it, you're, you're, you're losing a lot of fidelity and it sounds like a tape recording of a tape recording. And um, Another thing I've got set here is automatic looping. Um, so, like this song here, when I play it. This is what the loop sounds like. If it's there, it's going to go over here. So that just did a reset. Okay. And you can actually go in and set the actual times in here where you actually want it to reset. Tweak it so it sounds good. Got, uh, 
know, you can just does all your choreography for you too if you want. Well, it's not a program anymore. Yeah. The music is just a fairly small portion of the program. I mean, it's growing bigger all the time. But so what choreography program you got in there? This is mine. What's that? It's, it's, it's CSDS. It's Can you animate it while it's playing there? Um, well, it, 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 this is just snapshots from here to there. Oh, okay. Um, I do have a couple of animations on the web that you can look at if you want to. I'll pull one of them up here. Do I need to have this cool Is there a beat counter? Oh, um, there is a beat counter, sort of. One, one of the problems we had, um, when you go down here, So that, 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 well, where I was... So if you say, I want to play all my records at 132, any of them that you have already set the beats for, it'll be able to adjust them? Um, in the future, it will. There's a, there's a beats per minute field here um, that you can set once you set it. It's safe. Right now, it doesn't do much with it. Um, in the future, it'll be able, you'll be actually able to, be able to set where you want to go. And this, this program's still being written, and I get comments, and so it's always being tweaked. And it'll eventually... Get, get to be a right now. Right now, it's kind of I, I kind of think of it as a teenager. You know, last year it was kind of like a little baby a music player. Now it's like a teenager. It's growing up. You know, another year or so, I think it'll be real, really the music session will be such a real great. Um, yeah, if I count, if I save the beats, would save it in here, and they would know that forever. But here's the animations that I have on the web. Somebody can back them up. But eventually that'll be an option inside the square dance choreography system so you can see Yes, it will eventually, but that's fairly low priority. That's, a, that's low priority right now. <laughs> this was basically to prove that I could actually do this on the web using JavaScript. Um, I actually have an animation program that actually generated all this stuff that I wrote like 15 years ago. That I that it's just I, it's too cumbersome to tell them where to show all the uh, set up all the, the traffic patterns to do that. I mean, setting up the swing the fraction here took you know, probably half an hour to an hour. It's like you have to set that up for every single call. Yeah. So it's like it's way too much time until I get a quicker way to do it. It's like I'm not going to bother. Do you want to see how to set up a dance? Yeah. But I can't see the screen right now. Yeah. I think you need to bend it up. Yeah, we are. There. That's better. Right. <laughs> it's a weird angle here. <laughs> no, you can't see the screen. Okay. Well, you go to dance. You go to new. And you give it an... Uh, it's just a file name that's going to save as. Okay. Well, it brings up this confusing screen. Yes. Right. All right. So up here you give it a name of a dance, like uh, you know, whatever, whatever the name of the club is or whatever the level is or whatever. I'll call it... Uh, doesn't matter. Um, Thank you. 
Okay. Then, then what each one of these things are, it's called a frame here. Each one of those corresponds to one of the windows on the uh, call from screen section. Oh, okay. Okay. So each one of these is a window. So basically, like here, maybe you want to put. Uh, you want to put all your singing call figures in there. Mm -hmm. you give it a name. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let me make sure you what I got out here. This lets you sh shows you what all your date, where all your scenes were stored. Uh, I might probably have, let's take like mainstream scene calls MSS. Okay. So what I would do is I have to give it the database.